and I'm old enough to remember All You Need Is Love, live, one of the turning points in our cultural and technological progress. And we can reflect that we are ourselves right now at one of those turning points. For the review of our charter is a moment for us all to reflect. When I was asked to return to the BBC, I knew I'd be here for the charter review on which we have now embarked, and I welcomed that prospect. That's because I saw that while the review would present great challenges, it would also give us great opportunities. Opportunities to hear the views of others, to learn, to reflect on new ways we can serve our audiences, and to change as technology changes. Therefore, opportunities to reshape what we do as the needs and expectations of our audiences change and grow. Opportunities for this generation of the BBC to leave its mark on the information age. And as we conduct this open, I hope thoughtful exchange about the future of the BBC, we should set out our starting point. We live in one of the most creative and advanced information societies in the world. And the BBC has been vital to that success. And in that British way, with a healthy helping of accident and a fair bit of design, we hit on something that worked. An organisation that could ensure extraordinary, universal public provision while fostering one of the most impressive and diverse media markets anywhere in the world. And the licence fee has been critical to that. Because the BBC was funded by the licence fee, it had creative freedom. Because it was funded by the licence fee, it could be universal. Because it was funded by the audience, we needed to nurture a relationship of trust and consent. Creative freedom, universal reach, trust and consent. And these are the watchwords of the BBC. When I was at the Royal Opera House, the great brand guru, the late Wally Olins, worked with us on how we could better express what Covent Garden hoped to achieve. Watching us, he said, the Opera House stood for excellence without arrogance. Well, you don't become a guru for nothing. Wally Olins had put his finger on exactly the ambition a public institution should strive to achieve. And I couldn't better express how I want the BBC to be in everything it stands for now and in the next decade. Excellence without arrogance. The challenge we face up to in what we're publishing today is how to continue to achieve excellence in a time of change. The BBC is approaching its centenary in 2022. In that time, we have faced much technological change. And each technology has seen the BBC adapt and prove its value in a new environment. Yet in this long history, I wonder whether there has ever been a technological challenge as bracing and exciting as this one, as bracing as the challenges and the opportunities posed by the internet. Today, we're going to explain how we're going to meet that challenge. We will show how the BBC will reform and thrive in the, in the internet age, to do what has always motivated us to serve our audiences even better. And I believe our proposals will lead to a more creative, more distinctive BBC, and a BBC which is more personal to all of us. They build on the BBC's many strengths, but remain true to our founding mission to inform, to educate, and to entertain. Our proposals also reflect the economic times we live in. And make no mistake, there will be tough choices ahead. But as you listen to what I'm outlining, let me stress, this is not, this is not an expansionist BBC. We are offering a BBC producing the highest quality programmes and delivering services that provide great value for money. We understand how important this requirement is and the hard work necessary to meet it. I really appreciate the commitment I see in our teams and from the brilliant creative talent working with us. So, can I just say to all of them a very big thank you. But if we make the right choices now, 
Britain can have a BBC that excels globally, a BBC that is a creative powerhouse for the whole of the United Kingdom. The BBC belongs to everyone. We are stewards for an institution that's part of their lives and something they cherish. And as I said on my first day as Director General, I believe the BBC's best days lie ahead. The BBC, British, bold, creative, and I believe what we're outlining today heralds a better BBC for everyone. Now, I would like um, briefly and personally to talk to you about a few of the basic ideas that inform our proposals, ones which are especially important to me. And in particular, I'd like to introduce you to our idea of an open BBC for the internet age, a BBC that is truly open to partnership, working much closer with others for the good of the nation, and a BBC that is more open to our audiences too. To understand our vision for the future, though, the right place to start is with the case for the BBC. Our future doesn't rest on ideological arguments nor on debates between economists. It rests on what we do. The BBC has a very simple purpose. We're here to make great programmes and services. That's why people love the BBC. That's why they enjoy it. That's why they trust it. That's why they value it. That's what they pay us to do. The BBC strives to enhance the lives of everyone in the UK in more ways than ever before, and more often than ever before. We aim to fire the imagination and curiosity of our audiences. We invite them on adventures they never thought of. We allow them to wander through knowledge, to be introduced to new ideas, to stumble upon new interests, to find new passions. We connect them to new worlds and to each other. Sometimes we just make them laugh, and that's great too. We entertain, we educate, we inform, but we also enable and inspire. As the historian R.H. Tawney put it so well, only those institutions are loved that touch the imagination. 46 million people across the country use the BBC every day. Virtually everyone does every week. And at the heart of the philosophy behind the BBC is therefore a very simple, very democratic idea Everybody should have access to the best, whoever they are, wherever they live, richer, poor, older, young. We are here to bring the best to everyone. For 93 years, the BBC has played this role in our culture. We are part of what makes the UK the UK. We are part of the fabric of the nation. We are part of how other people see us and why many people abroad would like to have a BBC of their own. And one more thing. We are the cornerstone of one of the most successful media industries in the world. If the case for the BBC rests on what it does, it follows that we must understand the foundations of that success and build on them. Before we can create an open BBC for the future, we must support and advance what makes the BBC special today. So here, more even than our plans or our hopes or our designs for the future is the single most important point I want to make. We want the BBC in the next decade to be a magnet for creativity. The place people come to make brilliant programmes, programmes of distinction. For producers, directors, writers, artists to have the creative freedom to do things they would find harder to do elsewhere. And by the way, that isn't just coming from me. It's what Peter Kosminski, who directed Wolf Hall for us, Hugo Blick, and other extraordinarily gifted people, it's what they tell me. We want to employ the best people with the best ideas doing their best work. To get great teams to work together, to help the next generation of talent find their voice. We are gonna take risks, push boundaries, try new things. Not to be afraid of controversy, investigate, experiment, innovate, we're going to commit to small audiences as well as large ones and to commit resources to the big moments and issues that shape national life and Britain's place in the world. So whatever else we're going to do, we're going to change. We have to change and we want to change. But whatever else we do, we're going to be true to all that has made the BBC great throughout this century. We're going to make the BBC the showcase of the best Britain can offer, not just to this country, but to the whole world. And our aim, as we set out in the paper we're publishing today, 
is to create a BBC that is more distinctive than ever and clearly distinguishable from the market. To repeat, to create a BBC that is truly British, bold and creative, and to do so in a time of change. The BBC's mission was set nearly a century ago by its founding father, Lord Reith. It was to inform, to educate, and to entertain. And that mission is as pertinent today as it was then, and as necessary in the future as it is now. Like every other broadcaster, we are facing a world in transition, a changing digital world that presents new challenges, but let's be clear, also presents exciting new opportunities to serve our audiences. At present, nearly all of our audiences enjoy the BBC's programmes and services scheduled over its airwaves. That isn't about to stop. The majority of people will continue to enjoy radio and television, as now, over the next decade. But it's changing. Increasingly, in a way made possible by the internet and by mobile devices, people are enjoying what they want, wherever they want, wherever they are. Indeed, it's perfectly possible by the, by the, by the middle of the next decade, that becomes the main route to what the BBC does. So for the next 10 years, we will need to ride two horses, serving those who have adopted the internet and mobile media, while at the same time making sure that those who want to carry on watching and listening to traditional channels continue to be well served too. And that's where the idea of an open BBC for the internet age comes from. The Internet age strengthens the case for the BBC and its enduring role in serving the public. In the Internet era, it's easier to find information but harder to know whether to trust it. It's easier to find small communities but harder for the nation to speak to itself and to the world. It's easier to make content but harder to find the financial support for high quality work. And the Internet age is great for those who can afford it and access it, but those that can't risk being left on the margins of society. And to these problems, the BBC provides an answer. In the internet age, our mission is simple. Great British programmes, a trusted guide for every one of us. We want to take all the opportunities the internet creates to inform, educate and entertain in new ways. And to that traditional mission, we would add a fourth imperative to enable others to do that too. We want to open up the BBC to be Britain's creative partner, to become a platform, a catalyst for this country's incredible talent. We intend to put our technology and digital capabilities at the service of our partners and the wider industry, bringing us closer together for the good of the country to deliver the, the very best to audiences. What will this open BBC for the internet age look like? First, the internet will transform our traditional mission to inform in the current decade. It will be easier to offer more people information they can trust more quickly, and they'll demand more, more quickly. So over the period of this charter, we'll make a transition from rolling news to streaming news, news in the palm of your hand. This year's general election represented a turning point in how we all consume news. The day after, one in five adults got their news from the BBC on their mobiles. Those are record numbers. So if you want to serve our audiences with the news they expect and trust traditionally from us, we have to develop still further our services to them on mobiles. Mobile also provides the best opportunity to deliver a more personalized news service and to inform audiences in new ways, the relevant data, context, information that everyone needs delivered to suit their requirements. A bespoke BBC News, if you like, made to measure for you wherever you are. Inevitably, because we're a broadcaster, this will be a more video-based service complemented by audio, graphics, and text live from BBC News. It will be the place to go to find out the facts and to understand the story behind them. It will also be the backbone of our global news operation, helping us to reach that target of half a billion people building on the unique power and brand of the World Service, one of our country's greatest assets abroad. This is a service we want to strengthen and expand through new proposals we're also publishing today. My own strong view is that this is one area where this country's voice 
could be so much stronger, especially in the Middle East, India and Russia, and the states that may, used to make up the Soviet Union. And what we are offering will not just be a modern, made-to-measure global service, but it will also be far more open at a local level too. We will open up the BBC to other news providers through a new partnership which we hope will help local journalism to thrive. We've been working with our local newspaper partners on what I think is an exciting scheme. Local democracy really interests me. I've seen for myself how important our local radio stations are, and I'm really proud of the way they serve their communities. But now I want us to go further. So in the future, the BBC would set aside license fee funding to invest in a service that reports on councils, courts, public services, and so on. And we would make available our regional video and local audio for immediate use on the internet services of local and regional news organizations. In my view, that's good for audiences, good for the industry. But we look forward to hearing the views of others. And together with our partners, we'll be consulting on this through the BBC Trust and adapting it as we learn from that consultation. Part of a more bespoke BBC is that we also propose to reconfigure our new co news coverage to meet the changing expectations of audiences right across the UK. As the pace of devolution quickens, we will need to adapt our services on television, online and radio to ensure that they fully reflect on are able to report the increasingly divergent politics of the UK. We will never give up our role in reporting the whole of the UK back to itself. But we also have to recognize that news in some parts of the country simply does not apply in others. What we want to look at, how, within existing resources, we might better configure the BBC's news offering across the UK, and by the way, how across the range of our services more broadly, we reflect the nations of the UK to the whole UK. So, an open BBC in the internet age will inform. It will also educate. I was lucky enough to be with a stargazing live team at Jodrell Bank earlier this year, so I know how to answer uh, this question. How do you find a supernova? Don't look at Brian over there for the answer he knows. You need 40,000 volunteers, the world's most powerful telescope, and five days to go hunting for unidentified celestial objects. Now, a few years ago, this would have been a pipe dream, but this year it happened. Stargazing Live's viewer volunteers classified two million heavenly bodies, including five supernovae. Five supernovae. 40,000 citizen scientists, two million stars, five million viewers, a chain reacting of learning. Only the BBC can do that. A BBC with a new, more open and collaborative relationship with its viewers and listeners. And in the next charter, we want to do much, much more. In science, we'll be supporting the largest public engagement program we've ever seen in our country. Meanwhile, we want to bring together our world-famous arts institutions and in doing so, open up our country's combined riches to delight and inspire us all. And this is just the beginning. In the 20th century, Britain created the World Service, a democratic gift to the world. In this century, building on the wealth of British knowledge and culture, we want to offer another gift, the Ideas Service. It's a core part of our vision for an open BBC. The Ideas Service will be a new platform for the arts, for science, for ideas that matter, and for the people who want to explore them, an open online platform. The service will host the best content from the BBC, but also, alongside that, some of the country's leading cultural institutions, from the British Museum to the Royal Shakespeare Company, from the Edinburgh Festivals to the Liverpool Biennial, from this amazing institution here, the Science Museum, to the University of Manchester. It will draw together online all the great things the BBC already does that we know our audiences love and cherish, from Radio 4, for instance, or BBC 4, BBC 2, Radio 3, or our I Wonder Guides. All of these have been playing their individual parts in our broadcasts and digital output. But until now, we haven't effectively brought them together to become more than the sum of their parts. And this is a new opportunity, together with our partners, jointly commissioning with them. Because crucially, the Ideas Service won't just be about what the BBC does. It will be as much about our partners and what they do as well. 
I'm delighted Brian Cox is here this morning. He's been brilliant working with us on this, and you'll hear from him shortly. And some other leaders who've been inspiring us, Sir Paul Nurse and his team at the Royal Society, Maria Bolshaw, who's doing extraordinary work in Manchester, and Sir Nicholas Sorota, Director of Tate Museums and Galleries. But today, I want to invite everyone in Britain to take part in delivering this new service. Like stargazing live, it will only be possible if millions of people watch or listen Tens of thousands contribute, and a huge range of UK institutions have the chance to be a part of it. Our new open BBC will act as a curator, bringing the best from Britain's great cultural and other institutions and thinkers to everyone. Britain has some of the greatest cultural forces you'll find anywhere, and we want to join with them, working alongside with them, to make Britain the greatest cultural force in the world. We are extremely ambitious for this new service, where Google's mission is to organize the world's information. Ours, in a smaller way, would be to understand it. We will work with anyone who can help us understand this ever more complex world. We would cover the big questions the world cares about and engage in a dialogue with our audiences about them. And we'll curate this service to make it easy for everyone to find what they need to know. We are also ambitious for what the idea service can deliver for Britain. We know that the BBC's Year of Science in 2010 led directly to an increase in applications to study science at university. Now we want to go further. We want to help raise the number of people who experience arts events each year. We want to increase the nation's knowledge of the sciences, of the arts, of culture, and of our history. And in doing so, we will help make Britain one of the most, well, play to one of Britain's greatest strengths are great cultural and intellectual institutions, helping them find new audiences in the UK and around the world. But an open BBC in any age wouldn't be the BBC if it didn't entertain. For our audiences, this is the number one priority, and rightly so. Drama, comedy, and the entertainment help us to understand who we are, to make sense of our lives, and they bring us together. We know how much drama on the BBC means to our audiences. Drama is something this country excels at. It's recognised globally. And I want British drama to be the backbone of a more distinctive approach to all our services, capturing the public, public's imagination with world-class work for a global stage. It's occasionally been suggested that the BBC should stop being a mainstream entertainer because the market can provide mainstream entertain entertainment. But is anyone seriously going to propose to license fee payers that their fee should only go to the niche programs and services, that we should stop doing all the things they love most? What makes the BBC work is precisely the combination of popular programming, great popular programming, with the depth and range that only a public service provider can guarantee. Being a public service broadcaster puts on us a special obligation to make programs of distinction, to ensure that BBC programming is bold and creative and the best, to ensure that overall we don't just replicate what is already out there. So I want to make the BBC the most distinctive it's ever been. But being a public service broadcaster also means understanding what the public wants us to provide, a broad, popular, mainstream offering that makes people feel their license fee has been well spent. It's central to this plan that the BBC gets entertainment right and gets it right for a broad and changing audience. The internet has now transformed how drama and other long-form programs are distributed. In the last decade, the iPlayer helped a nation make the unmissable unmissable. And now I want to experiment with the BBC issuing bigger and bolder series all at once on iPlayer so that viewers have the option to binge watch. The iPlayer helped create a market and others followed with successful players of their own. But the result is that consumers have to search across many different video players, and Britain may be losing out to global players who are busy building platforms that could become gatekeepers to British content. We want to explore new opportunities to help bring original British content together, to help audiences and industry alike make the most of this opportunity to support our cultural crown jewels. Our aim would be simple, to increase the traffic to and investment in original British content. At its heart would be a free offer with BBC content funded from the license fee. We would also aim to make it possible to buy and keep programmes, much as we're doing with BBC Store. 
One possible route is to use the iPlayer, which we'll put at the service of the sector, using its brand, technology, and reach. But there are other ideas too, all of which we want to discuss and hopefully agree with partners. But the ambition is clear, a platform for Britain's creativity, an even better experience for UK audiences. We want to build with others a gateway to the world for British creativity. There is much in the paper we're publishing today that I haven't spoken about this morning. There are many arguments made there that I haven't made in this speech. I haven't set out the data that tells the story of BBC success in the last decade. I haven't talked in detail about how to define the test for distinctiveness. I had to leave you something to read. But there in the document, I hope you'll read it too, are many of our plans I haven't spoken about. For example, our iPlay service to revolutionize children's broadcasting, which I think is a really brilliant idea. Our plans worked up with the music industry for music streaming. Our plans for more drama on BBC One and many, many other things. Each of these could be a speech in itself and knowing me, each one probably will. Instead, what I've tried to do is to share our vision for the future, give you a flavor of what to expect from the BBC and introduce you to the idea of an open BBC for the internet age redefining the BBC's relationship with the nation, with our world-class institutions, and with its audiences. A BBC for Britain, a BBC for all of us. Our proposals do not mean a bigger BBC. I believe they do mean a better BBC. No one should doubt that the budget settlement announced by the Chancellor in his July budget will mean some very difficult choices ahead. Having already saved 40% of the BBC's revenues in this charter period, we must now save close to another 20% over the next five years. Our share of TV revenues in the UK will fall, most likely from about 20% now to some 12% by the end of the Charter. Our size relative to the other giants of the media world is small, and over the next decade will diminish both relatively and absolutely. In summary, the BBC faces a very tough financial challenge. So we will have to manage our resources ever more carefully and prioritize what we believe the BBC should offer. We will inevitably either have to close or reduce some services. We will also have to change the way we work. We all want a simpler, more effective organization where as much money as possible goes on the programs and the services. But we also want a BBC which will pioneer, will innovate, and will adapt to the new challenges we face whilst holding on to the core values of the BBC values that we all hold dear. Our new open BBC will be a true partner with other organizations. It will also strike a new relationship with audiences that will allow them to do so much more. Our new open BBC will inform, educate, entertain, and enable. The innovations we've proposed today are the start of a new model for the BBC. The BBC as an open platform for British creativity. We've always sought to bring the best to everyone. Now we will have the opportunity to bring the best from everyone, with everyone, too. An open BBC that uses technology as never before to give our audiences even more. An open BBC that works with creative organizations, partners, others in the media, to provide a platform for their work so more people can enjoy it. An open BBC that is truly seen as a partner. An open BBC where people can learn from cradle to grave and explore new ideas. Let me be clear, an open BBC is a million miles away from an expansionist BBC. Indeed, it's the polar opposite. It comes from the desire to partner and share. It comes from the recognition that technology gives us the opportunity to do things very, very differently. It comes from the belief that the BBC must do even more for Britain as a whole. That's the direction of travel I favor, to make public service better by modernizing it, to deliver a more original, distinctive BBC, a digital BBC, a universal BBC, a BBC that continues to help Britain be a creative powerhouse recognized the world over, a BBC that's creating jobs in one of the industries that's a great British success story. We will strengthen the things people love about the BBC while making them fit for the new age. Because a diminished BBC would diminish Britain. And because the story we tell here in this gallery should always be a British story with a BBC at its heart, 
For all of those who care about the BBC, this is a time to listen and reflect, to make your voice heard, and for us to welcome that debate. And the BBC will trust, will be consulting on all of these ideas and your thoughts too. Make the right choices now, and Britain will enjoy a BBC that excels in the global digital age, as it has done in the past. Closer than ever to those who pay for it, doing a great and vital job for the creativity of these aisles. The BBC is a great national asset. We are all stewards for the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. Now, this, this morning, you're not just, just going to hear from me. Uh, in a film we're going to show now, you're going to hear from some great voices talking about the BBC they, they believe in. And then after that, you're going to hear from Brian over here, uh, who, who is going to, to expand on one of the ideas uh, and talk about a new age of wonder, part of the idea service. So uh, here now, a film from some people who you'll recognize talking about the BBC they love. This is BBC Television. the time for you to become the king you should be. Look at this, humpbacks all over the place. It's an explosion of life. I look at Ibiza proms and think, where would that idea have come from? It was really fantastic innovation. For these little creatures, it's just beginning. The BBC is our window on the world, but it also brings the world to us. It's not actually the, the earthquakes that kill. Whoa, it's the falling buildings. For those that live our life on iPlayer and catch up, the BBC is certainly part of a trusted part of our lives. on it told us to some degree what to think. There is an opportunity now for the BBC to be more of a platform for allowing other people to express their views. The BBC being more open will mean that it becomes a partner with arts organisations in conceiving projects, in developing and commissioning new ideas from young artists, emerging artists at a much earlier stage in their career. I think it means that viewers will have an opportunity to see a much wider range of content. Arts organisations will be thinking about much bigger and wider audiences. The BBC is simultaneously local, regional and national and international. And what the arts platform offers is the, the sense that we might be able to have a conversation about culture that speaks from Glasgow or speaks from a small arts centre on the Isle of Bute or somewhere in the Outer Hebrides or the furthest reaches of Cornwall. I'm really excited that the BBC wants to kind of put that forward as the, the 21st century view of Britain.
The BBC has this great power of reaching people. And we in the science establishment have the great power of producing authoritative understanding of science. And if you put both of those things together, you've got a real formula for success. <laughs> Look at that. We have to get science out there, in a sense, to empower the people. The idea is to use the BBC to connect the great scientific institutions of Britain, the universities, the museums, societies like the Royal Society, connect them together and connect them to the public. So we use the BBC's infrastructure, the BBC's expertise in communication to, to get those ideas out and to bring the ideas from the public in to make Britain the best place in the world to do science. People come to me and ask me, how shall I find the, the uh, de decent stuff? There's so much rubbish on the, on the web. And I tell them, well, bookmark. Make sure to cherish that set of places that you go to. The BBC should be trying to be one of those. It's 8 o'clock on Wednesday, the 2nd of September. The headlines this morning. Journalistic quality. That is uh, being unbiased politically. You want people to say, yes, I've heard on the BBC, so I believe it. By setting that example, I think you'll find that people who blog, people who produce their own material locally, will emulate what they see from the BBC. Hello there, and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Hi, welcome to the programme. Hello, this is Business Live from BBC News with Ben Thompson and Sally Bundle. BBC is the best export of Britain. The World Service is helping many countries in raising awareness, in improving the quality of life, and uh, giving very balanced and uh, very um, uh, less biased news. So BBC really has a key role, you know, not just in Britain, but across the world. A strong British music industry and subsequently the success of our artists globally really starts with the BBC believing in those artists. As is always the case with Trucker Day, some people like it, some people don't like it. We're huge supporters of what the BBC wants to do in terms of the digital music space, ultimately creating the best experience for fans to engage in music, to hear new music first, to have it on their playlists, to have everything in their mo on their mobile phone, to have everything on iPlayer and their computers. I heard music that inspired me listening to the radio growing up, and whether it was Radio 1 Extra, Radio 2, Radio 1, or even BBC TV, you've exposed my music to millions of your listeners and viewers. I'm forever grateful. My whip for the force of my coop, beast my click for the force of my creed. Better night will be loving you till it's 70.
for children, there's a world out there that's expanding by the minute and by the day in terms of digital learning. But it's very difficult to children to know actually where to go, what's good, what's not so good, and for parents too, where they can trust. The BBC is trusted, a trusted partner already for most families and indeed partner for children as they grow up. And it's that trusted content that children can rely on and it's important that we see within the BBC. I spend a lot of my time going out and meeting school kids and what I find is that they love active learning where they're actually dictating the way of the learning. Now with the proposals put forward by the BBC I think they're going to be doing creative learning. They're having all this information but they decide where it goes and I think that's how kids learn best. Children live not only in their physical world but on their digital world now and the BBC are understanding that and reflecting that in the proposals that we'll see. It has all the marks of turning into one of the biggest public engagement programmes um, that we've ever seen in the United Kingdom. It represents an opportunity to show what's vital and exciting about what's happening in the United Kingdom today and what makes us special. The BBC is in the unique position of being able to bring all the great national institutions of Britain together and act as a bridge to the public. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honour to be here in the Information Gallery at the Science Museum, and I'm very grateful to the Director General for giving me the opportunity to talk about a project called the New Age of Wonder, which is part of the new Ideas Service. This is, as you saw in the film, the largest public engagement project ever attempted. Put very simply, it's the idea that the great scientific and cultural institutions of Britain will come together with the BBC to make the country better. Now, in 2014, the Treasury and the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills released what I think was a superb document. It's called Our Plan for Growth, Science and Innovation. It rightly noted that Britain's long-term prospects are inextricably linked to our success in knowledge-intensive services and industries. That's science and engineering, but also the arts, education and creative industries. Areas, fortunately, in which we already have strong foundations in place. Look at our universities. Uh, the UK has 1% of the world's population. We spend 3% of research funding, but we produce 8% of the world's academic publications, and we receive almost 15% of the highest impact citations. That means that we're the world's most efficient nation in generating new knowledge. This is the foundation of our economy. Knowledge intensive services and high tech manufacturing contribute over 40% of our GDP and rising. Those figures, by the way, come from a report called The Scientific Century, published by another of our great national institutions, the Royal Society, the world's oldest and most prestigious scientific institution, which celebrated its 350th anniversary in 2010. That year, the BBC partnered with the Society to deliver the Year of Science which included my first two series, Wonders of the Solar System and Stargazing Live, but also series by Robert Winston, Professor Ian Stewart, the Sky at Night and the Horizon teams, Bangos of Theory, many more. That season has been credited as playing a major role in the 52% increase in applications to study physics at university from 2008 to 2012. That's a very important figure. And it's not hard to understand or to credit the year of science, at least partly, 
Television is still the most powerful medium for inspiring and therefore influencing our young people. Professor Alice Roberts, Professor Ian Stewart, Professor Chris Lintot, Dr. Helen Chersky, Dr. Adam Rutherford, Dr. Maggie Adarin Pocock, Professor Uta Frith, Dr. Hannah Fry, Professor Jim Al-Khalili. Here is a list of household names. And crucially, all academics who are able to be role models, who are able to educate and influence young people because of the platform the BBC provides. And of course, my generation were influenced by Jacob Brumowski, Sir David Attenborough, Robert Winston, Sir Patrick Moore, all household names, again, because of the BBC. Now, that immensely successful 2010 partnership between the BBC and the Royal Society worked. It changed many people's views of science for the better, and it inspired some to go on to become the scientists of the future. This is the template for the much larger and much more ambitious project outlined by Tony Hall, A New Age of Wonder. Now, as I've already said, the idea is very simple. And that's a good thing, because simple ideas have a chance of working. In Britain, we have an unrivaled set of public institutions. The Royal Society, the Science Museum Group, the Natural History Museum, the Royal Institution, the Wellcome Trust, the British Library, the Universities UK, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Academy of Medical Sciences, the Royal Botanic Gardens, all these and many more. These institutions are priceless treasures. They're unique libraries and generators of knowledge. And I strongly believe that people of all ages and all backgrounds would love to wander through this knowledge. It's a national asset. It's owned by us, the people of Britain. There are many thousands, indeed millions of young people who'd have their futures transformed if they had easy access to it. How do I know? Well, let me just give you a personal example. Uh, I'm the patron of a school in Tower Hamlets called St Paul's Way. Ten years ago, it was a failing school. Today, it's the first Faraday Science School in London. It has an outstanding Ofsted report. A few weeks ago, the Minister for Universities and Science, Joe Johnson, opened the St. Paul's Way Annual Science Summer School. It was attended by many schools from the Tower Hamlets area, and it counted amongst its speakers the chief scientist at NASA's Johnson Space Centre. Its sixth form students worked with Queen Mary University on diabetes research. Half of the sixth form last year went on to study STEM subjects at university, and half of those were young women. It is a tremendous success story, and it supports my very strongly held view that the young people from all backgrounds want to learn, they want to be inspired, and they find science and engineering, and indeed the arts and creative industries fascinating and rewarding. They simply need access to information, and they need support. These students are our future. We cannot afford not to invest in them. And here's where the BBC comes in. The BBC is first and foremost a national institution. That means it exists to make this country better. It's also a media company, arguably the world's most recognised and trusted media company. It reaches 97% of UK citizens every week. And these are the people that our universities and our institutions want to reach, to inspire and to inform. So I think it's obvious, it is blindingly obvious, that together, the BBC, the Royal Society, the Science Museum Group, Natural History Museum, the universities, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and all those others that I listed earlier, can transform Britain. And as George Osborne said numerous times, they can help to make Britain the best place in the world to do science, and I might add, the best place in the world to advance the acquisition of knowledge in all areas of study. The key is for our institutions to have the maximum possible access to the public, and the BBC has this access. If we didn't already have the world's finest public service broadcaster, we would want to invent it to make this work. So forget all the media speak. Forget all the committees staffed by ex-media executives banging on about media landscapes and all that drivel. Uh, I'm with Armando Iannucci in his excellent McTaggart lecture. I do not believe that media experts, however excellent their track record, are the right people to make recommendations that affect the future of our knowledge economy and therefore the future of our country. It's too important. This goes way beyond that. I do, however, believe I live in a country with the finest institutions in the world, the best universities in the world, and the best public service broadcaster in the world. 
which at risk of embarrassing the Director General, now has a leader who is absolutely committed, who absolutely believes in the transformational power that rests with our great institutions. So this leads me to believe that we can make Britain the best place in the world to do science, to do engineering, to be an entrepreneur, to create and to generate knowledge if we work together. So I say to government, look carefully at how you can help strengthen these institutions, how you can help them strengthen themselves, because this will strengthen our country. One of the partners in the New Age of Wonder is the Royal Institution. It was founded in 1799 to make Britain a better place through science and engineering. Joseph Banks, its first president, wrote in its prospectus that the great public advantage will be derived from the general diffusion of a spirit of experimental investigation and improvement. Good taste, said Banks, with its inseparable companion, good morals, will revive. Rational economy will become fashionable. Industry and ingenuity will be honored and rewarded. And the pursuits of all the various classes of society will then tend to promote the public prosperity. And within 15 years, Michael Faraday was a laboratory assistant at the RI, about to transform the world with his invention of electric motor and generator. He was inspired to take up science on seeing a public lecture by Humphrey Davy at the RI, himself a passionate advocate of Banks' vision of a society transformed by knowledge. Here's how Davy put it. Nothing is more fatal to the progress of the human mind than to suppose that our views of science are ultimate, that our triumphs are complete, that there are no mysteries in nature and there are no new worlds to conquer. This vision of a country at ease with knowledge, a country that celebrates ingenuity, enterprise and discovery, a country that encourages and enables its citizens to become explorers of nature, knowledge and ideas, isn't old-fashioned, it's not romantic or quaint. People like Banks and Davy weren't hopeless romantics. They invented the industrial world and placed Britain at its centre. And I see no reason why we can't do this again. But it needs vision, needs belief, and the ability to see the incalculable value of our great national institutions like the BBC, to strengthen them, not to weaken them, and to enable them to work together in the interests of the people of Britain. This isn't just my opinion. In a letter to the Times this weekend, nine of our most eminent scientists, Sir Paul Nurse, Sir Martin Evans, Sir Andre Geim, Sir John Gurdon, Sir Tim Hunt, Sir Kostya Novoselov, Professor John O'Keefe, Sir Venki Ramakrishnan, and Sir John Sulston wrote this. Science can inform, educate, entertain, and inspire the nation. And no organization is better placed to support the science community to do that than the BBC. Now is not a time to restrain the BBC in this endeavour. Instead, we should show the political will to ensure the corporation has the resources and freedom to play its part effectively. Listen to that. Inspire the nation. Make our country the best place in the world to do science. Make the economy grow. Educate and inspire our young people. Encourage and enable our great institutions to work together with the BBC the world's finest public service broadcaster, the institution that speaks to everyone in Britain every day, and we can make that happen. Thank you. So that's the job we've got to do. Brian, thank you very much indeed. I mean, really, really inspiring. Um, we've got uh, a chance to take uh, four, five, six questions before I'm going to rest on John Shield, who's somewhere around, just to tell me, thanks, John, to tell me, we, we've got to vacate this, because obviously the public's coming in. Um, but four, five, six questions, be very happy to take them. And there's a, is there a mic going around? Or, yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, Sreya Kensoy from Tech UK, and um, we represent the technology industry in the UK. And um, it's really great to see that technology is very much at the heart of your thinking for the future of the BBC. I think as one of the largest and, and most innovative broadcasters, um, BBC has um, the potential to make a very significant and positive contribution to the technology industry itself in the UK. 
You talked about an, uh, an open BBC in the new internet age. I think that vision really requires a strong technology and digital industries in the UK. What role will BBC play in creating and supporting that thriving technology and digital industries? Well, I hope that um, by working uh, openly uh, with all sorts of partners, recognizing that what, what we do is to make programs, we make content, that that will kind of inspire and lead others to come and join us, to try new things, to experiment. I mean, if I go right back to my sort of um, uh, many, many years ago when I set up BBC News Online, the thing which got me there was to, uh, in a top floor of what is, you know, the old television center, um, locking um, the editorial people together with the technology people and seeing what could happen, and it was brilliant. And I think the more that we can do that, but, you know, recognizing that we are there to create content, uh, the happier um, uh, I will be. But also, I think what Brian was saying, and it's really important, um, you know, for the foreseeable future, you know, 10 years, whatever, um, we've also got the gift of being able to lead people from the big, bold, popular channels into areas uh, which might be, you might say are, are more specialist or more for me or more niche. And I think we've got to use that uh, in every way that we can because I think there are very few organisations that really do uh, bring the country together. Um, and uh, the BBC and um, doing things like Strictly on Saturday Night, which is brilliant. You know, those are things where we can lead people from things that bring us all together into things which really are important. So I hope what we're saying is that's our role, distinctive programming, but also partnering. And I think partnering is about acting as equals and doing things you couldn't imagine you could have done beforehand. So I hope that's what comes out of these uh, discussions. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Jane Martinson from The Guardian. Um, thanks for this uh, inspiring and ambitious plans, Tony. But would you not um, say you were disappointed then that you failed to convince the Chancellor not to impose a funding deal that will lead to 20% cuts over five years? And would you still describe that deal as a strong one for the BBC? Look, I think the, the, um, the deal that we came to the, to the Chancellor, um, uh, we did with the Chancellor in, uh, in July, is now behind us. I want to ensure that, that, that what was promised then is delivered. I believe he, he, he will deliver that. Um, uh, as I say, it's a, it's a tough deal, um, but I also believe it's a deal which, with, with which if we internally uh, think very hard about how we want to spend our money, it can enable us to do the ambitions that I've outlined this morning. But Jane, let me say one thing. This is not an expanding BBC. Uh, this really is not. So to those that may see this as, you know, here they go again, being imperialist, it's absolutely not. We have to live within the means uh, that we've got. Equally, we need to look at all sorts of ways of bringing more revenue uh, into the corporation, having done that deal. That's why I put a big strength today, a, a, a strong point about World Service, and looking to go to the Chancellor and say we need help with uh, World Service, because the need for World Service to be stronger is out there. It's why we're also looking at how we can do the same things, but more efficient, efficiently. It's also why we're looking to uh, grow what we can do with uh, BBC Worldwide. So I see it as a base, uh, that um, agreement with the Chancellor, upon which we've got to look at new ways to expand uh, the money we can bring into the corporation. Gavin Oldham, Share Radio. I thoroughly wel welcome your wish to bring in Sorry, open you. platforms and partnerships for the future. And what I'm wondering is where commercial radio stations actually provide something that the BBC is not providing uh, and really complement uh, that service. Would you open up your transmission networks across the United Kingdom so that actually our output can actually be uh, expanded throughout the country? Well, what I'm interested in is uh, the, and I'd love to talk about the specific point you're making maybe later, but what I believe in very strongly is an ecology in this country which works, where you have uh, subscription services on television, uh, advertising funded services on, te on television and also radio, and a public service uh, uh, funded by the license fee BBC. And that's why I put a huge emphasis on the distinctiveness of our services, of our radio services, which I happen to think are absolutely bloody brilliant, and television too. And that ecology serves our viewers and our listeners uh, really, really well. So if there are specific things you, you want to come and talk about, we're open and, and we can talk about them. But what I think I want to stress today is this ecology we have in this country is not as successful as it is by accident. It's because you've got that mix of public, private, subscription funded. Luke 
Crawley, um, speaking for, on behalf of Beck2, staff who work at the BBC, um, um, very interesting presentation this morning, very ambitious, and I think it's something staff at the BBC will welcome. Um, and it's clearly very important for the BBC to position itself in a way that makes it even more central to life in Britain. Um, I have to say that the funding question still rears its ugly head. And there's no way around the fact that 20% cut in income is going to mean some very serious changes at the BBC. And, you know, I don't think you're trying to duck away from that. But what's missing from today is some understanding of what's going to be cut, what's going to be closed, because the BBC, perhaps correctly, is no longer expansionist. I think that's right. It needs to consolidate. But you can't continue to do with 20% less money what you've been doing before. And if you're going to do all these things which are good, laudable, ambitious, and the right way to go, some very, very serious changes are going to have to happen at the BBC. Yeah. Thanks for your uh, uh, outline. Welcome, Luke. Can I just uh, say uh, how uh, I, uh, um, this is panning out over the next uh, coming months? Um, uh, first of all, today is about the ambition for the BBC. It should, we have to have a point when we, when we state clearly this is an organisation which absolutely has a future. Public service broadcasting absolutely has a future. Uh, next week, to those of you uh, who might be following my movements over the last bit, I'll, I'll, uh, next bit I'll be at the Royal Television Society conference in uh, Cambridge, when I want to lay out why the BBC matters to the creative industry. I want to build on, on some, of the, some of the arguments that I kind of went through rather rapidly this morning. Why the BBC matters to the, to the creative industries, and actually something I really care about, we should all uh, care about, I'm sure we all do, which is British content. What is it that will produce great British content? And British content, as you know, is going down, and actually the amount of it, and actually we, that's an issue for us. Um, we're then replying to the uh, government's green paper sometime early October, and then by Christmas, I want to say how we will get to the first part, <coughs> the first part of our financial challenge, which is uh, to ensure that by, 17, uh, by 2017, the beginning of the new charter, um, uh, we are in a, a, a balanced position. Some of you may remember I announced in July uh, 50 million uh, pounds worth of cuts towards 150 deficit that we've got then. That will come out of uh, looking at management layers, uh, the scope and scale of our uh, support services, uh, and so on. And that's tough. That's going on at the moment. By Christmas, I'll tell you how we're going to make uh, the rest of that add up. The question then, which is more longer term, is, all right, we have an ambition here to, uh, to spend extra money on these, out, on these services we've outlined by the end of the charter period and how to get there. I'm going to do that very carefully over the coming year. I ain't going to rush because I know that what our audiences expect of us uh, is excellence. And to suddenly say, OK, I'm going to lop off this here or lop off that there now would be foolish. I want to ensure that we're spending every single pound in the BBC on things that matter to our audiences. And that will mean some reprioritization, and it may mean some, some closures. But I'm going to do that with great care, Luke, because I owe that, not just to the staff, but actually to our audiences. Sophie Chalk from Voice of the Listener and Viewer. Um, in fact, you've almost answered what I wanted to ask, um, which is, if listeners and viewers are central to the BBC's plans ahead, which it sounds as like they are, and we welcome your announcements today, how are you going to find out what listeners and viewers really want from the BBC? Because it seems to me every time you want to cut a service, or you have to cut a service, you don't want to, but you mm. have to, there's an outcry. And the recent BBC Three announcements, I understand there was a lot of public opposition to that, but I'm not sure that that's really influenced the outcome. How are you going to consult with the public, and how are you going to really know whether you are properly connected. Well, you're, you're, you're completely right about an, an issue, which, by the way, is a good problem to have, um, which is uh, people love the services we provide. Not everybody loves it all, but actually people do love the services we provide. That makes it really... I mean, you could argue that the uh, threat to close Six Music was one of the best marketing jobs you could have done uh, for Six Music. So this is a, this is a, 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 a particular issue we've got. I mean, the, the, the trust is there to uh, weigh, as they have done with BBC Three, very careful, carefully. They've come back at us with things that they've learned from the audience and from other interested groups in the market out there. They've, they've asked us to change some things. That's what they're, they're, they're there to do. So um, it's a process. It's a much tougher process than for any other um, organization where things can just happen and they disappear. We're paid for by the public. That's OK by me. It's a process. Thank you. 
can I just say thank you? I really appreciate you all coming here on a Monday morning, especially uh, so early. I just want to give one little plug for Ian here, uh, the director of the Science Review, Ian Blatchford, Blatchford, who not only this gallery is fantastic, but opening very, very shortly is the Cosmo Cosmonauts exhibition, where you've got more kit from Russia than ever you've seen anywhere before. And it's a hell of an achievement you've managed to get this. And you can see Soyuz. And I have to say, when you watch on the news coverage and you think, Soyuz, there goes another Soyuz. This, this week it's a Danish person. So shortly it'll be a, a, a British astronaut. You see what these guys and women are going up in, and it's terrifying. It's an absolutely brilliant exhibition. It opens Friday. Please come. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.